Oh, yes, you're too heavy. That's not the right words ever, is it? No, and you're not my brother. Um, well, if you don't know, this video clip came from the Jungle Cruise. And in this scene, Frank, who is better known as The Rock, I guess, is trying to rescue the girl he finally refers to as Pants, because she's wearing pants in this movie. And, 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 and from those who appear hostile, and, and if you've seen the movie, you know it's quite the contrary. It's a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors. Their relationship is shaky, it's distrusting, and at times they're actually enemies. But it grows in into trust and, and sacrifice and love and faith for each other. And in traditional Disney fashion, it has a happy ending. Well, even though Rock doesn't seem to be quite the rescuer, fortunately, we have the ultimate rescuer, don't we? And he's not a Hollywood star, he's not a Hollywood actor, and he's certainly no professional wrestler, although Maybe you could say he's a wrestler if you look back to Jake. I'm not sure anyway, but we have the real deal in God incarnate who rescues us from sin. And he did this for us while we were still sinners. It's so humbling. He paid it all for all. It is indeed amazing grace that he rescued us from sin. But... How we as individuals come to be rescued by grace through faith in Christ Jesus and become justified is often uniquely our own story. And some of our stories are tragic. Some are somber. Some are exhilarating. And some are quite reserved. Now, when we do come to Christ, we end up in relationships, don't we? And this is where I get to have some fun. It's on view, Eric. This, as many of you might know, is a hockey stick. Great tool this is. You can use this for all kinds of things. You can reach around and pull chairs to you. You can close doors. And it is a very uh, respect-gathering instrument that we see used often in sports. And if any of you are hockey fans, you know last night our Tampa Bay Lightning went to the next level, and they will be going once again to defend their Stanley Cup, going for a three-peat. But where I'm going with this, more importantly, is that relationships between people can grow in many ways. Hockey would be one of them. And for many reasons, they're far too often based on what can I do for you and what can you do for me. In hockey, you work hard at skills, and you spend unreasonable hours at unreasonable hours of the day practicing and developing your skills, honing your skills. And then you get to travel and you play games and such and such and such. If you play hard and score, you will be elevated. For example, in hockey, there's four lines typically, four, three, two, and one. And the top players, the most productive players are in the first line. Well, that's all well and good, but if you don't score, if you're not diligent at going to practice, you will end up getting moved down. And so what happens is you lose your standing to the very point that you could actually be off the team. It is a classic example of cause and effect, which by definition notes a relationship between actions or events such that one or more are the result of the other or others. Thankfully, our relationship with God does not hinge on works or victories or defeats or scoreboard. Last week, Pastor Eric preached on the problem of sin as it's presented in Romans. And during that, we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at what keeps us from knowing God's truth. We, we, we looked at grace as our hope and justification. And justification is freely given to us by his grace. And we set our hopeful, and I want to like make sure we get this hopeful idea straight right here at the beginning. Because we're going to be talking a lot about this through today's message. This is not hope like, gee, you hope your favorite restaurant hasn't run out of chicken fried steak and eggs for breakfast this morning. No, no. This is about joyful expectation. Happy certainty. This is our hope in Christ, right? It's happy certainty. It's joyful expectation. It's not uncertainty. And it's based on grace. 
It has been said, the love of God is limitless. It embraces all mankind. No sacrifice was too great to bring its unmeasured intensity home to men and women. The best God had to give, he gave. And that in his only son, Christ Jesus. And that leads us into today's message. Because I was rescued from sin. Now I can throw behind that because this is always important to keep in light. Because of Christ's work on the cross. Because I was rescued from sin, I am justified by faith. I am hopeful in suffering and I am loved by God. Have you ever received something that you didn't deserve? And then discover benefits came along with it, right? I love benefits. If it's included, count me in. In our journey today, we are going to look at these three things that I've just mentioned that are a result of our rescue from sin and observe some of the benefits we receive along with it. Number one, I'm justified by faith. And we're going to be looking here at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to look at verse 1 first. Therefore... Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul has previously established that the only way of salvation is to be justified by grace through faith. Now, he will tell us what the practical benefits of this are, explaining that it is more than an interesting idea. You see, we are justified by faith. And this speaks of a legal decree. This is God's declaration, right, that we are justified. Romans 1 through 3 found us guilty before the court of God's law. Then Paul explained how, because of what Jesus did, the righteousness of God is given to all who believe. Our guilty sentence is transformed into the sentence of justified by faith, just as though... Offenses have never happened. And because we are justified by faith, we get peace. And peace is a benefit. Peace with God means that our problem with sin has been eternally settled by the blood of Christ. We were enemies, but now in Christ we have peace with God. And Jesus is our peace. In this peace, we have a new relationship with God. God becomes our father. We become his adopted children. And how glorious is that? It is just amazing. He is no longer like our judge. Sometimes we need to be reminded of this because sometimes we just let the world pull us apart and then we think, oh, God doesn't like me anymore. And doesn't. Nay, nay. He loves us, loves us dearly. Verse 2. Through whom we have gained access, access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Another benefit we have is access to God. Before our salvation, we stood in Adam and we were condemned. But now in Christ, we have a perfect standing before God and can enter into his presence. Right? We can enter into the heavenlies. It's amazing, right? So our access into the standing of grace is only by faith, and that is faith through Jesus. We cannot do this with works. Works will not get us into the standing. This is a blessing beyond peace with God. And this access to God is a lasting privilege. We are not brought to God for the purpose of an interview. Right? We're not getting hired. Right? But to have an everlasting loving relationship with him. Another benefit is hope. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. The unsaved person is, with, <clears throat> excuse me, is without hope. But we can boast in the wonderful salvation that God has given us in Christ. Now, the word boast means in this sense a triumphant rejoicing confidence. And hope which never implied uncertainty for Paul. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. For it can be translated here as happy certainty. Hope of the glory of God reflects our confidence or happy certainty that the purpose for which God created us will be ultimately realized. This is the logical conclusion to such peace and a standing of grace. So, as we are justified by faith, let's look at living by faith. In Galatians 2.20, it says, 
I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul realized, this is beautiful, listen to this part now. Paul realized that on the cross, a great exchange occurred. We talk about that, don't we? When we receive Christ, we have the great exchange that occurs. He gave Jesus his old try to be right before God by the law life, and it was crucified on the cross. Then Jesus gave Paul his life. Christ came to live in him as he does to us. So Paul's life wasn't his own anymore. It belonged to Jesus Christ. Which might pose the question, are we following Paul's lead? Do we generally, I mean genuinely embrace that? And do we embrace that as we go? Importantly, we can't live the new life Jesus gives us on the foundation of law keeping. We are to live it by faith, and that faith is to be practiced, not occasionally, but continually. It is to be central in all that we do. Martin Luther stated, and this is great, Faith connects you so intimately with Christ that he and you become, as it were, one person. As such, you may boldly say, I am now one with Christ. Therefore, Christ's righteousness, victory, and life are mine. On the other hand, Christ may say, he is no longer that sinner. His sins and death are mine because he is joined to me and I to him. Do we have and hold to this mindset as we go? The faith Paul lived by was not faith in himself. It wasn't faith in the law. It wasn't faith in what he could earn or deserve before God by his works. It was faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. Heading towards our next point, we find another benefit we have is daily confidence. We can boast in testings or suffering or tribulations. Why? Because we as Christians not only have a hope, a happy certainty for the future, we also have confidence in the present trials of life. The formula looks like this. Testing plus Christ equals perseverance. Perseverance plus Christ equals character. Character plus Christ equals hope. And that's where we arrive. Note. We do not glory. We do not celebrate being in trials. We do not celebrate about them. What we celebrate is that when we're in them, we have our hope. We have our certainty in the Lord that all of his works in our life are indeed for our good. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather just have God sprinkle some patience and some character and some hope over me while I'm sleeping. And then I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I'm a better Christian today. But that's not God's plan for us or for any of us. Before I move into this next point, I want to share a story with you. I got a, um, um, a call from a very dear friend of mine this past week and he was disturbed. And I said, what's wrong with you? And he goes, the devil's attacking me. Satan's attacking me. I said, whoa, you know what's going on? And he's telling me that, you know, he just, he's, he's kind of depressed. He's kind of disappointed. He's uninspired. Things are just like leading him off of the straight and narrow path. And that's what he asked me about. You know, are, are, do we really have to stay on this straight and narrow path all the time? Because, man, because I just feel like checking out, like time out, right? I want to go to the locker room for a little while. And I said, no, no. I said, you are correct. We need to stay on the straight and narrow path. And he goes, yeah, but that, I have really trouble with it. And I said, well, it's not a problem. I said, this is what I was shared, and this is what I'll share with you. Because we all face trials and tribulations, which is what we're about to cover. But what I want to make sure you get is that some advice that I had received when I was much younger. And that is, make sure each and every day when you get up, you put on the armor of God. And I'm going to 
buzz through this because I don't have enough time to really elaborate it on as I would. But what do we have in, in, in when we put on the armor of God? It enables us to stand fast in trials and tribulation. Why? Because we put on the helmet of salvation. Who's our salvation? Jesus. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. Who's our righteousness? Jesus. We put on the belt of truth. Who is truth? Jesus. We walk in the thongs of the good news. Who's the good news? Jesus is the good news. We put on the shield of faith. Who's our faith? Our faith is in Jesus. And we bear the sword of the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. You put this on every day, and I guarantee you will be able to stand Satan's deceptions and attacks on you through the day. Now, another thing, and this is something more recent for me that I just come to do. For a long time, and it's not that I've been, you know, walking with the Lord for a long time, but for a long time I'm thinking, why can't I remember the fruit of the Spirit? Now, in the picture that you might want to paint, remember that the, the Lord is, and we're the branches and the Lord is the vine, and we're grafted into Him, right? And it's the Spirit that, that flows through us, and that produces fruit of the Spirit. And why can't I remember what those are? And this is what I've come to learn. This is not long ago, right? We have love and joy. We have peace and patience. We have kindness and goodness. We have faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And I'm telling you, folks, when you are faced with temptations or distractions or trials, if you run through those, you will find one of those is something that you can bear. And it will get you right through these things. I digress. Here we go. I am hopeful in suffering. Verse um, 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that the suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Paul isn't spinning out spiritual platitudes. He's not just spewing trite, meaningless statements here, and he is quite verbose. When you study Paul, the man should have a couple more periods in his sentences here and there because they just go on and on and on. But he uses strong words here. Sufferings or tribulations, as used in more formal translations of the Bible, is a strong term. It does not refer to minor inconveniences, but to real hardships. And Paul lived a life of tribulation. My goodness. Paul knew the truth of this better than most anyone. God uses tribulation or suffering wonderfully in our lives, although we typically don't get it. We just typically don't understand it. As well, God knows how much suffering we can take, which usually far exceeds the thresholds we think we're at with it. And he carefully measures the tribulations that we face. Moving into verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Perseverance, character, and hope is like a golden chain of Christian growth. One virtue builds upon another and another as we grow in the pattern of Jesus most every Christian wants to develop character and have more hope. These qualities spring out of perseverance, which comes through trials, tribulations, and sufferings. We may wish to have a better character and more hope without starting with tribulation, but that simply isn't God's plan, typically. Christians can rejoice in suffering because they know that it is not meaningless. Part of God's purpose is to produce character in his children. And for those of us who are parents or aunts or uncles or cousins, whatever, that you might have charge over little ones, that's exactly what you hope for as you're raising them, right? You want to see character developed with them. The hope that tribulation builds in us is not a hope that will be disappointed. We are assured of this because God has proved his intention to complete his work in us. The proof being the love of God poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Everyone who is a Christian has the Holy Spirit. But not every Christian lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And not every Christian walks in the Spirit. How are we doing here? Are we living, are we seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit as we go about our days? Are we walking in the Spirit? 
in honesty, I don't know that many people that consciously really pursue this on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a whole lot of days that I just get caught up in life and these things slip by. It's important to hold on to. Let's look at James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. James regarded trials as inevitable. He said when, not if, you face or fall into various trials. At the same time, trials are occasions of joy not discourage resignation. You see, the key issue here is, okay, we have this challenge in front of us. Are we going to be resigned? Are we just going to be discouraged? Are we just going to fall in defeat? We don't need to. It can be occasions for joy. We count it all joy in the midst of trials because, why? Because they are used to produce perseverance. And if we can remember that when we're facing these things, it's a wonderful thing. You ever have the occasion where you can't find your car keys? Yeah? And you go, oh, man, and you're real angry, and where are they? And you finally find them, and you ever, and I bet most of us in here have them. You know, I bet there was a reason for this. I bet there's a reason I couldn't find these. You know, I bet there was a reason I had three red lights up here before I got on the interstate. It's important to remember, we have trials, we have things, challenges that we face. The next benefit we have is the experience of the love of God. The Spirit sheds God's love to us and through us. God revealed his love at the cross when Christ died for those who were without strength, who were ungodly, who were sinners and enemies, thus proving his great love. Paul's point is this. If God did all that, all that for us while we were his enemies... How much more will he do for us now that we're his children? And that is a happy thing to think about. Number three, I am loved by God. Romans 5, 6 through 8, here we go. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, it may have seemed late to some during the day of Jesus, but Jesus' work was done at the perfect time in God's redemptive plan. Christ's love is grounded in God's free grace and is not the result of any worthiness merited by humanity. In fact, it is lavished on us in spite of of our undesirable character. Righteous and good may be synonymous terms, or righteous may refer to moral uprightness, while good may go beyond to genuine concern for others. Of course, we were neither. We were neither righteous nor good. We were but sinners, and Christ died for us. Some suggest this demonstration of God's love isn't displayed so much in that Jesus died, but it is seen in whom Jesus died for. That's us. In today's message, we rejoice that we are rescued from sin by the ultimate hero. We have looked at some of the uh, effects, some of the benefits of being rescued from sin. And it is only appropriate to put the punctuation mark on this message as we arrive at our destination of God's gift of salvation. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. God did not wait for the world to turn to him before he loved the world. He loved the world, that's us, and gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to us, to the world. Interestingly, the Jews of that day rarely thought that God loved the world. Many of them thought that God only loved Israel. The universal offer of salvation and life in Christ Jesus was revolutionary. Jesus revealed the heart of God the Father in sending God the Son to bring salvation, rescue, hope, and healing. 
to the world through him. And that love, that sacrifice, the very best God had to give, he offers each and every one of us. Again, the love of God is limitless. It embraces all mankind. No sacrifice was too great to bring its unmeasured intensity home to men and women everywhere of all walks. The best God had to give, he gave his only son, Christ Jesus. But make no mistake. Make no mistake. It is up to us to receive him. So the final question is this. What about you? Have you chosen to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? See, another benefit is that we can come as we are into his grace. Jesus knocks at the door of our hearts. But we need to invite him in and repent. If there's anyone here today that has never made that decision, that's never crossed that bridge, that hasn't thrown those doors open wide and said, come, Jesus, come. Now's the time. Today's the day. And I'll be happy to speak with you after service. And that leads us up to the offering. And uh, we're still not passing the offering plate just yet. But if you would like to offer, you can offer online. You can offer up front. You can send to the, to the church office. There's any number of ways that you might be able to do that. So with me, I just invite you to close in prayer with me. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word with others. Lord, if there's anything I miss said or was misunderstood, may it be quickly forgotten. Lord, may your spirit fill each of us here. May we all seek your spirit. May we walk in faith in your spirit, Lord. We are just so thankful, Lord, for all that you give us and all that you've provided for us from the very beginning to the very end of all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.